welcome to Intro Psych Sessions, the second season where I will rethink my entire Intro Psych course from beginning to end, asking friends and experts to help me figure out how to put it together in a way that implements recommendations and integrates the skills and knowledge that I want to give to my students. And who better to join me on this adventure, co-hosting the series with me, than Dr. Regan A.R. Guram. This is Intro Psych Sessions, Season 2, and I hope that these conversations will help you as you think about your students and your own intro course. Let's get to it. And now, a word from our sponsor. Endless distractions, overbooked schedules, information overload. Students face so many barriers to being fully engaged with their schoolwork. That's why Macmillan Learning's Achieve for Psychology gives you the tools you need to keep them focused on your course, before, during, and after class. Whether it's the exclusive author-created content, captivating footage in our introductory psychology video collection, or the self-evaluation of our goal-setting and reflection surveys, Achieve helps students stay focused on the course and makes it easy for them to tell you when they need extra help. See for yourself. Go to MacmillanLearning.com slash Psych Sessions 2023 special for an introductory tour today. Macmillan's Achieve for Psychology, engaging every student, supporting every instructor, setting the new standard for teaching and learning. Welcome back. I am looking at my good friends, uh, Regan Gurung, co-host of this Intro Psych Sessions Part 2. And I am looking at my good friend, Sue Franz, uh, currently in New Mexico and uh, teaching at Highline College, where she has been for a long time. A long, long time. And uh, long, long. That's a long, community. Long. <laughs> it's a community <laughs> college. But now, Sue, you're also teaching a course at New Mexico State University which I'm sure is a whole different experience for you. How's that going? Well, I haven't done it yet. So oh, okay. I'll, I'll let you know. I'll let you okay. know. But, you know, my full-time my full -time teaching career started down here in Southern New Mexico. Uh, mm -hmm. My first job actually was with the Alamogordo branch of New Mexico State University. And I was there in the, in the 90s. So you're coming home in ways. That's fun. We are. Yep. We're back home. Awesome. Awesome. Well, you know, what's uh, I, I, I think that I explained this to you, what we're doing here. Uh, it's completely self-indulgent. Uh, I'm on sabbatical. I am tearing apart, finally doing an, an entire overhaul on my Psych 100 course. I've been thinking through some things. There are, as, as I was telling Regan earlier, there are decisions to make at every turn. Uh, it's endless the way that you can do this. Um, but I have thought about a lot about who I teach and where I teach, um, what research has come up, what recommendations have come up in the last few years. And, and in this 20 minute conversation, Sue, we're only going to hit probably one or two topics. Um, and, you know, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm going to put you on the spot. Are there any topics that you are interested in? in hearing uh, how I'm thinking about them? Or are there any topics that you just think, well, this is the most important thing and this is what I want to talk about with you today, Garth. And, and by the way, can I just say too, Sue, you have been my mentor for a long, long time. And we have had lots and lots of talks about intro psych. Um, and so this is nothing new for us. But let me throw that back to you. Is there anything that you want to talk about? Well, and, and as and as Sue th even thinks about that, Sue, you should know that Garth and I have some money on one issue that you are definitely going to be interested in. So let's see if that comes up, Garth. Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's <laughs> All right, Sue. Yeah. No pressure. Well, well, hold on. Can I get in on that money? <laughs> <laughs> this is in Vegas. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I can't say that there are any, there's anything that I'm especially interested in talking about because I yeah. have no idea how you're planning on completely tearing apart your course. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's start here. Um, one of the things, when I think about your contribution to teaching of psychology, one of the things that just I always hear is that we need to be teaching 
the things that people actually need to know <laughs> in life. Uh, can you just can you just say a little bit about that? The intro psych course is taken by, we don't know, a million, million and a half students annually. We don't know. And most of the students are not psychology majors. And of the ones who are psychology majors, they're unlikely to go on to graduate school in psychology. So we're talking about teaching intro psych to everybody else. For instance, my... My telehealth physician has a bachelor's degree in psychology. The local owner of our favorite coffee shop has a bachelor's degree in psychology. And aside from them, there are plenty of people who have taken psychology. So what is it that they really, really need to know? And a lot of our intro psych courses, we end up talking about stuff that feels important to us, but is not necessarily important to everybody else. Yeah. Uh, Regan, do you tend, uh, do you find yourself kind of, uh, struggling with this issue of teaching the content of the course and the skills of the course um, in ways that that you struggle to just know that you're really connect, like you're gifting this to students so that they can actually use it in life. How do you think about that? Yeah, you know, and, and I think as I was listening to, to see you, I think that one of the ways that one of my challenges, and I have a range of challenges for myself as I teach the course. And one of my challenges is for every week, can I take whatever the content is and put it into the con uh, context of application and life, right? So for every single topic, it doesn't matter what it is, I make sure that I can find some very, very explicit applications. Now, along those lines, Sue, I'm going to push you on this a little bit uh, <clears throat> in relations to uh, to what Garth is doing. You know, Garth did mention tearing apart the course. And, and uh, you know, I know right next to him, he's got this mapped out what the course is going to look like uh, that he's now for, for our listeners. Wow, it, it is truly mapped out. It's a big board, people, uh, with lots of writing on it. Uh, and and Sue, I guess my question for you is when you think about exactly what you said, right, in the context of Garth tearing stuff away apart, um, how does that help you shape and pick and choose content? I mean, because, you know, I gave you my, yeah, I try to fit every content into it, but how does that guide your picking and choosing of content? And maybe that, you know, Garth, when he's staring and drawing on that sheet there, uh, you know, I wonder if it's in there as well. How, do you, how does it help uh, influence you choosing content given that strong inclination you have? Well, I recently... Um... So in a recent podcast that I did with Eric, talking a little bit about the new textbook I have coming out, I had to face that front and center in ways that were unexpected. Because my wife, Verla, has been hearing me talk about how we have to completely revamp the intro site course and talk about what people really, really need to know. And so I'm revising this book and all chapters go to Verla for for her editorial approval before going on to my actual editor. And she would write on those pages. She would say, do our neighbors need to know this? Mm. And sometimes the answer was no, no, they don't. And I'd have to take it out yeah. because I couldn't justify it. In other cases, I could justify it. So that's ultimately, I think, what it comes down to. Is there a direct application, for example? Um. I think as one example, the therapy chapter, that was one place where I, I put in a bunch of content that typically isn't in intro psych textbooks. Students, what is it that students really need to know about therapy? Well, they need to know how to find a therapist. They need to know what happens in the first psychotherapy session because so many people are just scared of that, that first session. And they need to know the ethics code that psychotherapists go by. They need to know what the different kinds of mental health professionals are. And for that, I had to research <laughs> what exactly are the differences, because I never had that clear in my own mind as to what the differences were. So, so many, many years ago, when I first started teaching, I came across a quote, and I'm sorry that I, I hope someday that a listener is able to provide it to me because I've lost the source and I've lost the direct words of the quote, so good luck finding it. But the quote essentially said, for everything that we decide to teach, we are choosing not to teach something else. 
And that has really stuck with me. Yeah. Because if I talk about um, if I talk about the action potential, for instance, what is it that I am excluding to talk about that? Yep. If I talk if I talk about the the deep history of psychology, what is it that I now don't have time to talk about? So so for mm-hmm. me, essentially, that's that's a long answer to your to your question, Regan, which is I just have to consider. How and, and are students going to use this information? And Sue, what did you bring up such an interesting dichotomy because on my screen right now, I see Garth who's planning the course design and I see you who's, you know, just gave us a great example in terms of a textbook. And I think that's what I love about being an instructor is that, you know, I we can make course design decisions yeah. Right. Garth on his wonderful sheet there is making course design decisions that nobody is going to review. But you, the textbook author, you know that when it goes to some reviewers, some of them are going to say, I want that action potential. And I love the fact that you brought up the action potential because I can remember that great conversation we had at a coffee shop in Palo Alto talking about content in books and, you know, but yeah, yeah you're right. As a textbook author, you've got those pressures. But Garth, in you designing the course, you can go, this is what I want to do. Okay. And maybe, you know, getting to yeah. structure would be cool. You know, the structuring of that design. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. So I've been listening and now I want to, I'll just share how, because I think the, what we're talking about in this conversation is content. Um, and I was working on a project this last year with a couple of our friends, uh, Jen Thompson and Aaron Richmond. And um, w- one of the things that, this group wanted us to do was to um uh was to kind of gather all of the topics taught in the best-selling intro psych textbooks and pull all of those learning outcomes for the entire course it was it was a crazy job um there was spreadsheets involved okay so as we're doing this uh they wanted to cover everything. I get why they have to, I get why high school psychology has to do that. They're kind of stuck in it. Now, now we're not, but that was such a good thing for me to remind myself that I am not going to teach two thirds of this. <laughs> I'm just not going to do it anymore. I'm going to show you all what I have done. And even as Sue's talking, I'm feeling a little guilty that I have more cutting to do, or it's not guilt. It's just like, I don't know. I just feel like I have more cutting to do. But you see this spreadsheet here um, on on the left. This is probably pretty small for you all. And of course, our um, listeners can't see it. But anyway, we have uh, the topics in each chapter that I'm going to uh, give time and attention to. And, um, and, and then also some of the more engaging and kind of applied ways I'm going to do this. Now, I'm looking at something like um, nature and nurture. Well, maybe not nature and nurture, but I'm looking at biological psychology and I'm thinking about um, the function and structure of the brain or sensation perception. And those, when you get into topics like that, yes, we can find a case study and it's interesting to students. But Sue, where is that line of is it, does your neighbor need to know this to improve their life, their community and their world? Or is it going to benefit them? What about those kind of murky things that we feel like, well, we kind of have to include that because it's like a foundation of psychology, uh, but it's really not going to serve my students that well? What do you think? I think it is going to serve your students really well. If they suffer a concussion, for instance, and they're having some peculiar sensations as a result and some memory issues, yeah, having understanding is going to help. When their grandmother has a stroke, for instance, to be able to understand why their grandmother can't do what she used to be able to do, but then through plasticity is able to regain some of that function. Yeah, I think that's pretty important. Yep. And yet, and yet to teach any of those topics, you are not teaching another topic. Like you can't get away from that. So there is a prioritizing that has to go, um, which I think is okay for you to say, what do I love teaching about? Right? 
And I think it's also important to remember that if you're using a textbook or you're using OER, you can provide students with other reading material. All of our students can manage reading and you can require that reading. So you talking about something isn't crucial. If your book is covering it, you probably don't need to talk about it. Interesting. So how do you balance right now? I am basically having students like the way that ebooks are, are go e textbooks go now. Um, I can go through a chapter like biopsychology and I can choose the sections that I want them to read and I can skip the sections with a click of a button, just a checkbox, and they'll only get assigned those parts of the chapter. Right. And so, um, so I'm generally my plan is to basically only have them read the content that they're going to be working with in class with assignments or or whatever and not having okay and and this is juxtaposed to when i first started teaching i said to students bad teaching by the way this is bad teaching i said you're responsible for everything in the book and um you're going to be you're going to be, be assessed on everything in the book and we'll just talk about some things in here right so that's not a good way to go right well, I, I yeah, for for the listeners, Sue nodded and you know uh, nodded with a sort of a scans maybe maybe not. And God, I think that's right there quite an interesting assumption because I would bet there are some listeners uh, whose philosophy is we don't have to cover everything in the classroom. And I think to some extent, I can even argue that if we give students the skills on how to read and adjust uh, and apply, we don't have to be covering everything, which is which which brings me to something I'd love to have both of you t- take on, which is we've talked about content, but we've also tiptoed into what are we covering into the classroom. And here, Garth, you know, you your structure, I'll say the word, especially with interteaching, is very structured to have students do things in the classroom, which really influences how much you read, right? But I think, how much do you want students to be doing in the classroom? And Sue, when you look, look ahead, you know, is there, a, how, how are you envisioning what's going on in the classroom? So like Garth, I, I do the interteaching. Students get a bunch of questions in advance. They answer the questions. They come to class. They discuss in small groups about what they understand, what they don't understand. They tell me what it is they'd like more explanation about. And that's how it is we spend our classroom time is divided between those small group discussions and me offering extended explanation where they're struggling. But all of those questions I have created in advance and they are targeting specific topics. Now, Unlike Garth, I, so I've been working on those questions because I'm working with a new book and I'm revamping everything, not completely tearing apart my course. I'm just revising the questions that I'm asking. And in some cases, there's content in the book that I think students would be very interested in, like a lot of the stuff on, on drugs and consciousness, for instance, that I don't necessarily want to take time in class to talk about. So for the things that I'm, I'm pretty sure students are willing to read on their own and interested in reading on their own, it's still in the book. So, so I'm not, I'm not thrilled, Garth, about you removing content. Mm-hmm. If there were a way for you to flag content, mm-hmm. if there were a way for you to say, we're not covering this in class, but I've made this stuff available to you to, to read at your own leisure. I Interesting. Like, I, I, I think, I, I think that it's. <laughs> I don't know if I agree with your premise that, and and it might be me projecting the kind of student I was that I am not. I want to do what's assigned. I am not interested in doing more than that. I am not that student who is going to go read. Now, I, I get the the drawbacks of that, but here here's where I think, yeah, I think we're arguing. Um, so I. Which is which is great, yeah. right? <laughs> right. So what I'm considering doing is actually really focusing the con the attention to particular content with the hope that it gives me more time to hit that content multiple times, and maybe the students will do a better job at learning it. So really, yeah, not even giving them access to a bunch of what I would deem as peripheral stuff or whatever. I don't know. Um, we all know it's not about 
the intro psych, I, can we say it? It's not all about the content, right? There is a skills piece uh, that is as important. We, I think we'd all agree as, as the content. And right now, my theory is that as I really keep excess content out of the course, I can, I might have a better shot at students learning the content that I do want to emphasize. I don't know. So well, that's and that's happened. an that's an empirical question, isn't it? I mean, you know, Sue, you and Maureen did a, a great paper on using myths to teach the course and showed that even uh, some years later, students remembered stuff because of using that approach. And I, Garth, I think what you said is just another really key empirical question, you know, uh, is downstream four years, three years, let alone one year, are your students remembering more because of the approach you took versus somebody else who may have used a different approach. And the reality is we don't have that answer yet, Yeah, uh, but we've got to, you know, we've got to be, be open to it, to yeah. the question well, at least. Well, and then the part that we, we haven't talked about is, is what level of content are we talking about? Yep. If we're talking about the seven overarching themes if our students can come out of the course knowing APA's seven overarching themes for intro psych, I'm ecstatic. They may not know about the, they may not remember the action potential. That's they may right. not remember that neurotransmitters are called neurotransmitters. But if they know the big overarching themes, then I'm happy. Yeah. And that's one of my problems, one of my many problems with multiple choice questions is that they tend to go in um, like a, like a laser and pull out individual content. Yeah. So, uh, detailed content. So for instance, okay, uh, here are the different stages of sleep. Here are the different kinds of waves that are associated with those. Is it really crucial for students to memorize which wave goes with which stage of sleep? Yeah. Probably not, but that's a common question in, in test banks. But is that well, really what it is we want students to know? Well, somebody who's, who's listening to the series right now is thinking, why haven't they brought up outcomes yet? Because that's how you design a course. And so you did. Thank you for that. And obviously, we start with outcomes. The IPI has recommended uh, outcomes that I'm actually using in my course uh, now. And so that's where I started from. Um, I will tell you, and I know we only have five minutes left, but I will tell you that Oh, is this going to deviate from where? Okay, that's fine. We're still going to go with it. Um, the themes, <laughs> I, I'm finding it really challenging. The language you all chose, Sue, for give examples of psychology's integrative themes. Give examples of. I really want to be true to the recommendation for this outcome. And 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 I realize I'm pretty rigid sometimes, so I can read that and I can I can say, hey, I really want my students to be able to give examples of. That's hard to do. That's kind of a writing exercise, isn't it? Or a, an oral kind of presentation exercise to say, give me an example of theme F, whatever. So um, how how I I don't know that I am currently the plan is to assess the theme uh, with. Uh, a, a end of the week kind of assignment uh, that is pretty consistent where students are going to apply what they've learned to one of the themes. But um, I do think that that's a pretty high level to, uh, you know, to, to do that with a theme thoughts. Some of the themes are going to be easier than others. Mm hmm. Well, I, 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 I want to I want to go further though, and and Sue and and here I want this is a shout out to Sue circa twenty fourteen, uh, older Sue, uh, pre, older version Sue. I mean, you know, you you mentioned not being as fond of multiple choices, and and I think we many most of us share that, but here's exactly where new assessment comes in. Garth, you mentioned outcomes, right? But the next step is looking at your assessments, yeah. and I and this is a shout out to older Sue because way back when we when we both worked on the strength 
strengthening intro psych, right then, one of the assignments that Sue came up with, nicely foreshadowing these themes, was a end-of-term paper where you come up with examples illustrating key themes in psychology. And I still use a version of that paper today. And actually, as recently as this week, when my students are taking finals, I'm reading what's now evolved into what I call the visionary paper, where they have to pick one of those themes, provide examples from all through the term. So I think it's it's also rethinking assessment, you know, and how we do it, because there are some really neat ways to get students thinking about directly the themes. And Garth, I think that's why I'm excited to hear more, you know, about your remapping and how you're doing it, because I think it sounds like you're getting at more ways to get at those themes. Well, and I'll tell you that uh, our first conversation, Regan, the theme was structure. That's what you and I talked about before yep. before Sue was here. And uh, and I think the only thing that I would add uh, to what you're talking about um, with a paper like that is to build in the themes as you go through the course. So my my, I was formerly when I was just trying to piece things together, I was formerly taking these themes and blasting students with them in a single assignment. Seven themes. Watch these videos. Here's the themes. And then it was too much, I feel like, for students to take all at once. And so now in my course structure, I have... Um, it looks like in week one, I introduced two themes. And in week two, I introduced two themes. And in week three and four, I introduced one and one. And then I don't introduce the seventh theme until the therapy. It's the ethics. Um, and, and so that's the end of the term. Now, uh, I think that's going to be... That's going to give my... It's going to give me the opportunity to have my students kind of build on their knowledge of those themes. Uh, this is very different than what I was doing uh, in the past. And I, there was nothing systematic about the way I was working with those themes, if that makes any sense. So, um, so with those, yeah, go ahead. With those themes, you can also, after you introduce them in, say, week five, you can invite students to reflect back on previous weeks and pull content out that applies to that theme now. Yes. Yep. Exactly right. Um well, this has been uh, this has been enlightening. Um, Sue, I did have one question. Do you think that the way that you view content has changed since you've started to write an intro psych book? I don't think how I view content ha has changed. I um, I have had to go around uh, a couple rounds with my publisher about some content. And how's that? <laughs> uh, we comp we we compromised. Some stuff has been moved into an appendix. Unfortunately, it is a digital textbook, so student so instructors can move content yeah. wherever it is that they want to move content. And That's how great. do you but feel about how do you feel about the things that you curated for this textbook and presented that instructors can like me can just click off it and say, "Don't want that. Don't want that." Is that all right? I'm okay with that. It's in the end, it's your course. Yeah, it, it, it's the exact same thing that we did back with print textbooks that we would say, okay, I'm going to cover just this part of the chapter. Yeah. Students read pages, blah, 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 blah. It's, it's the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing well, I can do about it. <laughs> well, Sue, thanks for sitting down with us uh, to talk about uh, my intro psych course. I, I am challenged <laughs> about, um, making sure that students have access to things that they might find helpful or interesting on their own, even while I manage this very difficult task for me, which is just slashing content so that I can repeat it and make it more memorable, hopefully for students, which is my current uh, strategy. So uh, I've got a lot to think about. I appreciate it. Always a pleasure, Garth. Always good to see you, Regan. 